scandal, the birth. So welcome to our webinar, uh, Gossip, Intrigue and Scandal, the birth of the English Mad Song. During this hour with our panel of amazing and knowledgeable women, we will be unpacking a bit about what has become fondly known as the English Mad Song. Our featured guest, Diana Solomon, is an associate professor, professor of English at Simon Fraser University and has written numerous articles on the subject of women in restoration theater and published this wonderful book, Prologues and Epilogues of Restoration Theater, Gender and Comedy in Performance and Print. Uh, I'm Jessica Cooper. I'm the founder and director for the Henry Purcell Society of Boston, which is uh, sponsoring this event. Um, and I want to thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, if you're new, please say hi in the chat. Um, you can also drop any questions um, that you might have as we go along into the chat so that we might bring them up for our Q&A uh, portion of our talk today. Um, so I'm sure some will come up. <clears throat> um, so without any further introduction, I'm sorry, um, Adu, I'd like to make some introductions of our other panelists. <clears throat> um, so I'll start with the two ladies who will be making creative contributions this season with the Henry Purcell Society of Boston, um, Ms. Natalia Baldiga. Hi, Natalia, who is a, uh, she's not only a stage director and historian herself, but she will be appearing as Lady Macbeth in our June 11 production of A Restoration Era Macbeth. Um, so that'll be exciting. Truly a, a mad, a mad woman in that show. Um, Ms. Kirsten Cairns is the executive and artistic director for Enigma Chamber Ensemble um, Opera, which you can find on Facebook. Um, it's a small and nimble, uh, flexible group uh, whose aim is to stage new interpretations of well-known works. Hi, Kirsten. Uh, Kirsten is also our stage director for Restoration Era Macbeth, which is very exciting. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's unlucky to keep saying Macbeth on a Zoom. Not sure how that works, but anyway, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it very much. Yes, I. I know. I should be calling it the Scottish play. <laughs> Sorry, so, we're not in a theatre, so I think we're probably okay. I think we've escaped at this time. We are. We are literally ephemeral here on, <laughs> on the Zoom. Um, kicking us off with a crash course in restoration history so that you can have a backdrop and framework for the discussion um, and the presentation that uh, Diana Solomon will be giving us um, is Natalia Baldiga, who has taught theater history, theory, literature and performance at various universities. Natalia, thanks for giving us this brief framework for the period in which the Mad Songs took place. Um, they took hold of the imaginations of the audiences in London. And so let's, let's make that presentation. Absolutely. So let me hop into my PowerPoint for you. I just have a few slides. And so apologies to those for whom the Restoration Theater is home. Uh, this is uh, because it's not as well known as some of the other time periods. So the English Restoration Theater um, comes after the restoration of the monarchy. Most earlier than that, most people are familiar with Shakespeare's theater. This, of course, would be a recreation. But a bare stage, a stage without scenery, um, words created the scenery. Uh, who's on stage? On stage are men and boys playing all the roles, um, all the genders are performed by, by men. The audiences that were filling the galleries would be from different socioeconomic classes. Down, of course, in the pit, you would have the cheapest seats where you would stand for the entire time eating, drinking, and carousing. So this is the theater of Shakespeare's time. However, a little incident happens that completely changes the theater, and that would be the Civil War in England that occurs between 1642 and 1660. So you have the, the royalists, the cavaliers and their fancy duds, and then the, the people with whom you might not want to hang out, the Puritans, the roundheads. Yes, they don't like Christmas. 
yes, they don't like the theater, and that is that is a problem for for the English theater. And what it means is that um, you have theaters that are either repurposed during this time or they're just simply destroyed. So all those wonderful buildings, both the private theaters and the public theaters that were operating during Shakespeare's time have to go underground or the physical buildings are actually destroyed. So we have the Civil War. King Charles uh, I, Charles Stuart, actually loses his head in 1649. That's chopped off. And his son flees to uh, the continent. And so Charles, who, the person who will be Charles II, has been living in France for a very long time when we get to 1660. And that will be significant for the theater. Um, and I'll show you why. So Oliver Cromwell, whom you may have heard of, is ruling England as um, he's a Puritan general. And after his death, Parliament decides perhaps we actually want to restore the monarchy, hence the restoration. And what you have is a very different atmosphere. You have a king who's been in France who essentially looks French. He loves the theater. He loves actresses, which you have on stage in France. It's been a long, hard interregnum, a long, hard time between Stuart kings. And the English court is ready to party and they're ready to go to the theater. And so you no longer have a bare stage. You now have these enormous theaters with Italianate scenery. What does that mean? It means that there's fancy sets with stage machinery that can change from one scene to the next. There are exotic costumes, so many feathers that we bring from uh, the so-called new world. So feathers, feathers everywhere. Um, we have a new audience. The audience is now upper class as opposed to coming from a range of classes. And last but not least, something else that's new are women. We have professional playwrights. We have actresses, actresses, actresses. And this is an object of fascination for these new audiences. We haven't had women on stage professionally before in England. They're not as well paid necessarily as their male colleagues, but they are involved in the running of the theaters and some of them become superstars. There's a real fascination with this women, with their private lives, with their sex lives. There's something suspect about women being on display, professional women being on display. And so that becomes a real preoccupation of this time. And that's all I'm going to say. Um, it's a fascinating time. And to tell you much more about the women, I will turn it over to our wonderful featured guest, Dr. Diana Sullivan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalia, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Jess, for inviting me to talk uh, today. And uh, I also just want to acknowledge that I speak to you from the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Kwikwetlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. So gossip, intrigue, and scandal, the English mad song. There, there will be four parts to my talk tonight. The first is a brief um, discussion of the rise of the Restoration Actress, then an introduction to our featured actress of the evening, Anne Bracegirdle, for whom uh, all of these songs were written. Uh, then a brief history and features of the Mad Song, and finally, uh, including performances of Brace Girdle's Mad Songs and related songs. So as Natalia mentioned, before the restoration, we don't have women acting on the public stage in England. Um, now, I should note that women did perform on the court stage in England, and in fact, Charles II's mother, Henrietta Maria, was uh, a fond actress of court masks. Also, England was slow to get the actress, and when Charles II was, or before he was Charles II, when he was in exile during the interregnum, he saw actresses performing in places like uh, France and, uh, and Italy, 
um, may have given him some ideas. Charles comes back in 1660 and shortly after he is crowned king, patents are issued to start two theater companies, the King's Company and the Duke's Company, and included with these patents were permission to hire women to play female roles. We know that the first actress, we don't know who she was, but we know that she stepped on the stage on December 8th, 1660, and that she played the part of Desdemona. And in April, on April 25th, 1662, um, women acting female roles on the public stage was actually enshrined in an edict. So uh, even though it didn't exactly take place right away, um, over the first few years of the 1660s is when we have women uh, taking over the performance of female roles. So how did actresses change the theater? Well, this is at least a dissertation topic uh, um, in length, but I want to suggest a couple of ways. On the left, you'll see the frontispiece from John Dryden's play, Amboyna, and it's meant to suggest one way that actresses change the writing of tragedy. Restoration dramas in general were more sexually explicit than earlier drama. And so you'll see in this picture, there's a picture, um, there's, um, uh, it shows a man tying a woman to a tree in preparation for a sexual assault. So you can see her exposed breast, his, her disheveled hair and an uncovered leg. Um, so while sexual assault um, itself did not take place on stage, it usually took place off stage between acts three and four of a play. Um, audiences were frequently shown the aftermath where the actress on stage was adorned similar to this woman here in, in terms of um, you know, showing what she had just been through. Another way that women changed the theater in comedy was that uh, fully one quarter of all plays written during the restoration featured a woman cross-dressing as a man or a boy. And the way that they did that was to wear what's called the breeches costume. Now, this picture on the right is, uh, is a bit later um, than the restoration, but it shows how um, pervasive the breeches costume was. You can see here that the breeches costume was in fact much more revealing than the typical costume a woman would wear to dress as a woman on stage. Um, it shows the calves and the ankles of the actress, which were considered erotic. And so here you see Margaret Farrell Kennedy um, cross-dressing to play the role of Captain McKeith in the Beggar's Opera. So those were just two ways that actresses had an impact on restoration theater. So one result of women coming to the stage was a great audience interest in their personal lives. Some actresses had affairs or doubled as sex workers. Charles II loved his actresses and kept two as mistresses, Moll Davis pictured here, and Nell Gwynn, who uh, you saw a picture of earlier. And uh, incidentally, if, if you're a Nell Gwynn fan as I am, I had the great opportunity to record a podcast um, it's the BBC You're Dead to Me, uh, where I talked to the host, Greg Jenner, about Nell Gwynn. Um, so if you'd like to hear more, uh, that's where to turn. Another aspect of uh, women coming to the stage meant that um, an early version of the star system developed. People went to the theater to see a specific actor or actress play a specific role. And roles normally belong to that actor or actress for their entire career. Some actresses possessed what Joseph Roach has called the it factor, a combination of talent and charisma that is unique to each individual. And speaking of the it factor, it's now time to turn to Anne Bracegirdle who had it in spades. Um, 
Grace Girdle grew up in the home of the greatest actor of the age, Thomas Betterton, and his wife, Mary Saunderson Betterton, who is also a wonderful actress. She probably started acting as a child. She had a very wide range. Uh, she was famous for acting in both tragedy and comedy. And one uh, specific subgenre that she excelled in was the so-called she tragedy, uh, a new subgenre that started in uh, just about the 1680s. Um, and uh, as the name suggests, a she tragedy focuses on a woman's suffering. Sometimes that woman has, or that, um, that role, I should say, Sometimes that person has committed a sexual sin of some kind, while other times she is passive and vulnerable. Brace Girdle was also celebrated for her comedy. And one of the roles that we'll hear a bit about later is she played the role of Millamont in William Congreve's play, The Way of the World. Congreve wrote the part of Millamont specifically for Brace Girl, and indeed he wrote all of his greatest female roles for her. Another aspect of Anne Brace Girdle is that she was the most popular restoration performer of dramatic prologues and epilogues. Now, as uh, Jessica mentioned, this is a topic that I could go on about at length, since it is the, <laughs> the, uh, the subject of my book. But essentially, I'll try to keep this <laughs> really short. Prologues and epilogues were dramatic pieces, usually about 25 to 40 lines in length, that were performed before and after plays, especially plays in their first run. Their function was to advertise the plays. One reason that prologues and epilogues were deemed essential in the Restoration was because uh, the, the authors of new plays did not get paid unless their play made it to a third night's performance. Now that doesn't seem like that much today, but in fact, plenty of plays, you know, we're talking about a much smaller theater audience. Um, plenty of plays didn't make it to their third night. And so the key function of those prologues and epilogues was to say to people who had showed up for the first night, please come back the next two light, nights so, uh, so the author can get paid. And they did this in extremely creative ways, akin to today's advertisements. You know, sometimes advertisements today are, are super uh, inventive and these prologues and epilogues adopted very um, a variety of strategies to sell their plays. Brace Girdle was given the most number of prologues and epilogues to deliver during the restoration because prologues and epilogues were mostly delivered to, um, to the most popular or delivered by the most popular actors and actresses. Another aspect of Anne Brace Girdle's career was that she was one of the first female theater managers. She, Betterton, and their friend Elizabeth Berry, also known as a, you know, an amazing actress of the age, they became the theater managers of a new company, the Lincoln's in Field Theater Company in 1695. So in addition to being an actress, uh, and she was also a theater manager and a shareholder. And she created a persona um, of herself as the virgin actress. This made her stand out from other professional actresses. Um, at the time, for a woman to act was seen as selling one's body for monetary gain by, uh, by revealing it in public, something that could be um, a description that could fit acting or it could fit sex work. So actresses were usually assumed um, to have engaged in that work or at least were treated as if they had. Um, but Brace Girdle managed to establish this persona of herself as the virgin actress. Now, several satires questioned her virginity um, 
but I read that as a success on her part, because for those satires to be successful, there had to be enough people thinking or at least having heard of the fact that there was a virgin actress. And so, you know, they, they made their, um, uh, their sales based on this knowledge of her. She also attracted many admirers. At one point, it seemed to be a fad to have a crush on her. And Anthony Aston, author of a book of reminiscences about the theater, called her that Diana of the stage. She had a deep personal friendship with William Congre, uh, and, uh, and um, he wrote one of the songs uh, that we'll hear tonight, Loves But the Frailty of the Mind, for, uh, associated with her character of Villamont. Grace Girdle, of course, was also a singer, particularly of so-called mad songs. It was unusual at the time for actors and actresses to sing their own songs. Normally, a professional singer would, uh, would sing the, uh, the song, usually standing behind the curtain. But Brace Girl sang many songs on stage and she de uh, developed this reputation of herself as the mad singer. And John Eccles was known as her personal composer. She chiefly sang his music and he composed specifically for her voice. He wrote his first assigned theater song for her and it was hugely successful. And when she, Betterton, and Barry founded their own theater company, he followed them and became the music director at that company. So now, moving on to madness and melancholy in the 17th century. Madness was gendered in the 17th century. Melancholy, and this is um, the third edition cover of um, Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. Melancholy was gendered male. It had positive associations with it. It was romanticized. Melancholy connoted wisdom. The disordered male mind suggested the presence rather than the absence of knowledge. It was associated with the literary, and the gentry, and it was even considered fashionable to go visit the people staying in the, um, uh, the Bethlehem uh, hospital for, uh, for the insane, uh, the men that were, uh, uh, that is to say. But when it comes to women, it was, the term that was usually used was madness rather than melancholy, and this was bad. Madness meant passivity and weakness and was associated with hysteria. There was the idea that a woman uh, went mad because she had congestion around her womb uh, and, uh, and, or sometimes called the wandering womb. So there was a big difference and it's important to know that before we talk about mad songs. So what are so-called mad songs? The definition of a mad song is a song sung by a character who has who is going insane in a play, or less commonly, songs sung to such a character. The character has typically gone insane due to love sickness, uh, and typically it's a result of unrequited love. Some famous early mad songs are Ophelia's songs in Hamlet, uh, Desdemona also sings a similar song. She doesn't go mad per se, but she is thought to suffer from love sickness. And it should be noted that Brace Girdle played the parts of both Ophelia and Desdemona. Characteristics. Um, uh, so Amanda Eubanks -Wit uh, Winkler has written a wonderful book, Ole uh, Howl some heavy note, and she describes mad songs as musically unpredictable, defying logic as they shifted rapidly from recitative to aria, from body ballad to lament to furious melismatic ranging. And the appearance of the mad singer is also disheveled. Uh, she is 
speaking in a, a voluble, disjointed manner that violated the code of proper conduct. So this is a very specific kind of performance. Um, so three of the four songs that are recorded for, especially for this evening, are mad songs either sung by Brace Girdle or for Brace Girdle. And two of them are a response to a shocking event in Brace Girdle's life. So Brace Girdle, between 1688 and 1692, the first four years of her career, she was paired with a very handsome leading man, the actor playwright William Mountfort. They acted together, Mountfort and Brace Girdle, in 18 plays and played the parts of lovers in half of these 18. So a man named Captain Richard Hill developed an obsession with Brace Girdle. And on December 9th, 1692, he attempted to abduct her. Luckily, Brace Girdle was with two other people and together they were able to resist Hill and his friend. But after Brace Girdle resisted him, Hill seems to have thought to himself, oh, well, the only reason she's not going off with me is because she's having an affair with William Mountfort. So Hill and his friends sought out Mountfort and stabbed him through the chest. Mountfort died the next day. Hill fled England and was never heard from again. As you can imagine, <laughs> word spread like wildfire around London of this event. And several documents were published about the event that weren't particularly favorable to Brace Girdle. Uh, the most fascinating to me was a novel called The Player's Tragedy or Fatal Love, uh, which was written from the point of view of Richard Hill, the murderer. Uh, and in its very thinly disguised, uh, Brace Girdle is called Brasilla and Mountfort is called Monfredo. So these texts, uh, there were some satires, there were some poems, and there was the player's tragedy. And they suggest that Brace Girdle's reputation uh, for being a virgin had taken a hit. Brace Girdle returns, she takes a couple of months uh, away from the theater. And when she returns, she begins singing mad songs. These mad songs establish sympathy for her, yet also entertain by sexualizing her. So the first mad song that she sings is a mad song duet with Thomas Doggett. And this is Eccles' first commissioned theater song he and they hit it out of a park. And uh, in the song, Brace Girdle's character declares, I'm still a maid in the song. So her most famous song is I Burn from Thomas Durfee's Comical History of Don Quixote Part Two. The lyrics are by Thomas Durfee, the music is by Eccles. So, uh, Thomas Durfee's comical history of Don Quixote was actually a three-part uh, play, so 15 acts in total. In part one, a man falls in love with Brace Girdle's character, Marcella. She doesn't love him, and he dies of a broken heart. His best friend, Antonio, swears revenge on Marcella. In part two, Antonio saves Marcella from a rape attempt, causing her to fall in love with him, but he still blames her for his friend's death. Her unrequited love causes her to go mad, expressed in I burn. So now we are going to switch to, uh, to Jessica's screen because she's going to play the recording of I Burn uh, directly from YouTube, which we found uh, gives it better sound quality. All right. Here we 
we go. I burn, I burn, I burn, I burn, I burn. Thank you. So musically, Grace Girl comes off as pathetic and endearing. The opening bars of I Burn suggest madness when they spell out the E minor chord and then double time the meter. There is an unrelenting minor key and a phrase repetition that conveys madness and a scary, suspenseful atmosphere. Yet it also has moments of comedy. There, is an, there are octave leaps and there is an unusually active cello part. 
The smattering of different musical styles uh, creates what I call bipolar disorder in, uh, in the song. Lyrically, it references the body becoming physically raw. For example, it refers to pouring the two rivers on my soul, it will hiss like a coal. And this re recalls early 17th century patients who reported experiencing internal fumes when they experienced melancholy. The song was very successful. It was published in the music book of the Don Quixote trilogy and Durfee even goes so far as to boast about it uh, when Don Quixote part two is published. So moving on to the next mad song, uh, Durfee capitalized on the success of I Burn and wrote a reply. The reply was originally titled it, A Song Upon Mistress Bracegirdle's Acting Marcella in Don Quixote. We now know it as While I With Wounding Grief. And in this song, the male singer interjects himself into the unfulfilled couplehood of Marcella and Ambrosio. He suggests that he has caught madness from Marcella. Uh, Jessica, please play the song. So in this song, the singer suggests that he has caught Magnus from Marcella and says, from you, the dire disease I took and bore myself your pain. And his message in the song is, Marcella, forget about that loser Antonio and take up with me instead. He also, in a way, trumps her own madness because he uses the word rage where she had used the word burn. He says, for I much more do rage for you than you can burn for him. So his madness is even, or his melancholy is even stronger than what she has displayed in I Burn. Now the song I Burn has an interesting history because it was set by two composers, uh, Gottfried Finger, the Moravian composer, and then a second time by Henry Purcell. And Purcell also changed a few of the lyrics of the song. So Finger's version musically is simple, strophic, and rarely deviates from G major. The music is actually happy when, when uh, portraying rage. Versus Purcell returns the song to minor keys and the melisma typical of the mad song. 
Um, and the personal version is, I would say, much easier to access these days, but it's such a treat tonight to be able to hear the finger version. Moving on to the third song. Uh, this is, Oh, Take Him Gently From the Pile. So at this point, Brace Girdle was becoming known as the Mad Singer, and she performed this mad song in John Banks' tragedy, Cyrus the Great, in 1695. Brace Girdle plays the part of Losaria, and Banks is clearly trading on the success of her character Marcella in Don Quixote, because Losaria goes mad from unrequited love of Cyrus, the lead character. She sings the song while dressed as a Cupid with a bow and arrow. And after singing, she shoots Cyrus with an arrow, though he escapes unharmed. So Jessica, please play, oh, take him gently from the pile. Sorry, something's happening with the, uh, the feedback. Oh, such beautiful singing. Um, I, it's like two of my very most favorite sopranos here today. Let me see if we can uh, pause this and start it again. So we're at There is Fire in My Breast. <sighs> I'll just go back a little bit. Let's try again. Enough to set the world Hmm. Okay. All right, Amanda, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening here with the, uh, um, actually, why don't we, uh, try this again from one of our other can can we have one of the, our co-hosts um pick this up at 141 with a screen share um kirsten are you going for it uh if i let me just grab the link i don't actually have the link for that at the moment it, but hold on and i will i think it's in the chat it is yeah, okay um Let's see if my internet signal is doing better than yours. So when she sees the body on the pile, uh, I've always been curious, Diana, is that her lover or her brother that she's discovered? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's supposed to be her lover and she's imagining it. Uh, so it's part of her madness that she is, you know, she's, she's, dying for love of Cyrus, she imagines his body on the, the pyre. So the first verse 
is more passive and more um, uh, uh, imaginary. But then the second verse, she comes back and she's much more um, uh, warlike. She says, I am armed and declare for a vigorous war. And she says she's going to shoot the great Persian and shoot him dead. Uh, so it, it, <laughs> the tone really changes in the song. Yeah, she's like, I love you one minute. And then the other minute, she's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yes. And Amanda Forsythe's recording is splendid because it really picks up on the, the difference between these two um, verses. So I hope All right, well, let's, let's give this another try. We're going to try yeah, and I'm going to I'm going to suggest, especially seeing as how Dan has just talked to us about it there, um, and it's so beautiful that we go from the beginning again. Okay. Yes. Let's stop and start and share the screen again with the uh, streaming um, with the streaming sound. Uh, you, just you don't have that. It's the sound isn't coming through um, mm. for that. So when you share your screen, um, make sure mm -hmm. that. Uh, yeah, I did. Let me try it again. I don't know why it didn't. Uh, sorry about that. Hold oh, on. that's OK. Thanks to uh, thanks for sticking with us as we get this all figured out. Um, this was a great uh, recording session. Um, that we had back in October with um, with Sarah and Amanda. Um, so let's try this again. Thanks, Kirsten. Sure, of course. Hopefully that has worked this time. <laughs> Cupids. I watched the boy as he lay down to sleep and stole his ammunition from his side. And now I've got him, I will be revenged on all mankind, on all the sex at once, and shoot love's blades into their breasts. Stand fair. I'm on the declare of Peter's war by my bow and my quiver, I swear. Not a leaven to a love with I spare. This shaft I will draw to the head, to the head, and shoot, shoot, shoot the great Persian dead. I'm armed and a clever of vigorous war, by my bow and my quiver, I swear. Not a leaven to a love will I spare. This shaft I will draw to 
great. So, um, <laughs> so the song begins with a recitative. And as I mentioned before, the verse two is more violent. She <laughs> describes uh, how she will uh, shoot him. Um, clearly her character has, uh, has mixed feelings because she then proceeds to die after singing this song. And uh, then her ghost returns in act five and prevents Cyrus from getting killed. So in, in life, <laughs> she is rather um, vicious, but uh, in death, more, uh, more, more giving. Um, so finally, we'll move on to the fourth and final song of the night, which is Loves But the Frailty of the Mind. This is not a mad song, nor in fact was it sung by Brace Girdle, but it is intended to be sung by her character in William Congreve's play, The Way of the World. Now, Brace Girdle and Congreve had a very close friendship. Um, they were often together. Uh, they had what may be called a romantic friendship. He certainly wrote love poetry um, with her in mind. And uh, as I mentioned, he created almost all of his terrific leading ladies for her. So in the play, she plays Millamont. Millamont is a character who is beloved by Mirabelle, but early on refuses to commit to him. She can't bear to be serious, and she's one of Congreve's funniest creations. She, she has more wit uh, than anybody else in, uh, in the play. She's just wonderful. Millamont embraces active living, shall we say, whereas Mirabelle wants to be able to control or silence women. And so these two ultimately find their way to marriage through what is known as the marriage proviso scene in act four of the play, where they negotiate the terms of their marriage. And there's been a lot of literary criticism about whether this marriage proviso scene is uh, is proto-feminist because it gives women more liberties than they were would otherwise had, or whether in fact it's uh, it's quite um, uh, in some ways anti-proto-feminist because of all the restrictions and but because Mirabelle gets to dictate how Millamont want, um, should behave, but Millamont has no say in how her future husband will behave. But this song, Loves But the Frailty of the Mind, was sung before or leading up to the proviso scene. Uh, so Jessica, let's go ahead and play Loves But the Frailty of the Mind. Yeah. 
Thank you. So yes, um, I, I think this is an amazing song. And while it's not uh, specifically a mad song, uh, it's almost sung by a sadistic uh, singer. Um, the, the title of the song, Loves But the Frailty of the Mind, reads to me like a taunt. Um, and it's, it's funny um, uh, <laughs> to, to perform it right before Valentine's Day, right? Um, you have the singer is taking advantage of others' weakness. Love is, a, is portrayed as a weakness, and the singer is triumphing when others feel love, but not her. So she glories, she sings of glorying in piercing others' hearts and in winning at the game of love. Um, that last line, uh, that heart which others bleed for bleed for me. It's, it's a conquest. She's all about conquest and, uh, and, and about triumphing in the game of love. So it's very interesting that this song uh, appears when it does in Act 3 of The Way of the World before Millamont will then, you know, bargain away some of her rights in the proviso scene. I should mention also that the song was sung by Mistress Hodgson. So uh, Hodgson was a professional singer, and she would have been performing it behind the curtain during uh, 1700 performances of The Way of the World while the action paused. Um, so, uh, but, but the song was assigned to Brace Girdle's character. So definitely a different practice of singing than we're used to today. So I'm just going to share my screen with you one more time. And um, I'd like to end by, um, by showing this picture. So this is the... Um, uh, the front page of a songbook uh, published in 1695. 
the scholar Lucille Hook has identified the woman in this picture as Anne Bracegirdle, who is clearly singing. She's pointing to music with her left hand, and she seems to be keeping time with her, her right foot, uh, which, uh, which appears foreshortened, but nevertheless, she is clearly here in the act of singing. Um, it would be a nice speculation, uh, Hook writes, to, to imagine John Eccles accompanying her uh, when she's singing. But uh, I show this to, to say that it is wonderful that the Purcell Society of Boston is so interested in both promoting the music of Purcell and his contemporaries and in providing the historical and theatrical context for this music. Um, I've been fascinated with Anne Bracegirdle for many, many years. She's such an interesting figure. And I want to thank you very much for inviting me to talk about her. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Diana. I'll, uh, I'll unpin you here and go back to, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, The Way of the World, the last play that we just, um, that, 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 that song, that very catty uh, song was uh, from was one of the most popular um, comedies of the time, and I'm actually very curious about it. Uh, the Mad songs um, are have always been a source of fascination for me. First, when as a student of voice, and and there's some sort of there's some sort of freedom in the Mad songs, and and this was when I discovered that Baroque music could be passionate and it wasn't rigid at all, um, especially the music of Purcell, as I think um, many of us know especially um you know any singers here and i know kirsten's a singer as well um but there's just a tremendous am amount of freedom and a, an emotional um uh, like liberty that you can take within the song um so um it's kind of so we're sort of going to open the 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 q and a here um and um i know that some questions might have come up from our um in our audience. So if anyone wants to post anything in the chat, we will definitely get to that. I know that some people on our panel here have some questions too. We ran a little bit over. I'm sorry about that. Um, there were some technical difficulties. And um, this is, I'll just disclose this is my first web webinar, but um, uh, I, I have some pretty fantastic hosts and panelists here. So I feel very grateful. Um, Diana, that was really a wonderful, I'm gonna watch this again. Um, I want to learn more about um, about the history behind these uh, songs and um, behind this music in general. So, Kirsten, I think I asked if you would mind popping the first question. You did ask, and I wouldn't mind at all. I'd be <laughs> delighted to. Um, I find myself thinking so many thoughts, and and as you just mentioned, Jessica. Um, We'll be keeping an eye on the chat for anybody who wants to write a question in there of our attendees who are watching. Um, there's also the option of raising your hand. If you look at the bottom of your screen and sort of scroll over, you'll see a thing that says raise hand. So if you're like, I don't want to type something, you can also try that option out. But meanwhile, um, I'm going to get the ball rolling. Um, Diana, that was so fascinating. And um, I find myself thinking a lot about the position of women just in life in general but also this evening um and when you were saying when they you know when they started acting they got paid less than the men what a surprise and uh they were so objectified and so there was all the speculation about their their bodies and the ownership of their bodies and all of this and that women obviously uh couldn't their their madness couldn't denote wisdom because they didn't have wisdom to begin with it had to be dangerous hysteria and the thing that I found myself uh, thinking about was how when you go back to Shakespeare's place, for example, and earlier back to actual medieval court, you have the tradition that the fool, under the guise of a sort of phony madness, mm. can say things that nobody else can risk saying. And I wondered if you think that... Um, you were talking about how Anne Bracegirdle was kind of able to reestablish her reputation through the Mad Songs. I wonder if you think that women were able to risk expressing things in these characters they're playing, but as you told us, the actor and the character were often conflated in the two. Perhaps mm -hmm. if they were able to risk having a stronger voice 
under the guise of madness, because of that tradition of the fool or the mad person being allowed to speak truths that no one else would risk. And therefore, um, is it possible that these mad songs actually had some direct import, impact on women's voices gradually, I know it's taking a long time, becoming more heard and more acceptable in society and a bit safer for women to express opinions? Yes, uh, so that, that's a wonderful question and, and certainly um, wondering about uh, mad songs and what liberties they, they give women and, and whether they had any kind of lasting import. I guess I would say in response that um, they, they certainly did allow women to, um, to perform in certain ways that might otherwise be considered unacceptable. I mean, this kind of dishevelment of the voice of the body um, that, uh, that the singers per, um, uh, displayed um, when performing mad songs suggests a kind of um, relinquishment of decorum. Uh, when they are in fact singing. So, so there's a kind of license that is given to, um, to Bracegirdle and others when singing these mad songs. I don't actually think that in the long run, they did much to change women's extremely restricted roles. And I should say that, um, you know, the restoration, despite the fact that women were now um, uh, welcome to perform on stage, in, in other aspects of society, women really regress <laughs> from the Renaissance. So, you know, this is this one area that women um, uh, seem to advance in, but, but there's also, you know, uh, mixed feelings about these actresses. Um, uh, acting wasn't really seen as, you know, the, the wonderful profession that it is today, even though, of course, a lot of study went into it. And so I don't think that the mad songs themselves, um, uh, and, and there weren't that many of them either, um, advanced much. I would, however, say, um, and I, I realize you, you didn't ask about this directly, but I would say that prologues and epilogues um, did something to advance um, what women could actually speak on stage because a lot of these were comical and so they show women performing comedy on stage. Now I would argue that today we still sometimes encounter stupid articles by people like Christopher Hitchens that claim women aren't funny. And so when these when restoration actresses are up performing what I read as many uh, stand-up comic routines, um, that, that that is a huge advance. Now, whether that, uh, that changed things in, you know, in London society, I, I really can't go that far. But I, I do think that, that there are some things that are performing on stage that, that start to show at least select women in select um, environments having a bit more agency uh, to discuss certain topics or to perform in a certain way. You know, I, that reminds me of what you're talking about, the fact that there's actually fewer um, opportunities for women professionally. I think that's maybe is, is one of the things that makes women suspect, right? Uh, actresses suspect is that there aren't professional women. And so there's something about that professionalism that is itself questionable. And so there's some fabulous questions in the chat, so I don't want to take up, uh, take up time. But what I was thinking about, I can't, I can't resist saying this, is the virtuosity of those mad songs, mm -hmm. right? So you can have, you can have a woman up there who's, who's singing this song about being out of control and madness is not validated for women in the way it is for men. But there's something about that virtuosity that reclaims power and also says, I'm not just up here so you can see my disheveled body. I'm not just up here as an object to gaze upon. Watch me do this. And the virtuosity of the complexity of those songs is, you know, almost says you need to take me seriously because they're, I can They're do very this. much in especially, control. Yeah. Right. And especially if you're someone who can actually sing your own songs and not just mouth them you know, if someone's behind a curtain. So, so there's some interesting threads with professionalism and what's and propriety and virtuosity, but 
I, I will stop there because because there are some wonderful questions in the chat. So we actually have a similar question from from two people, both asking about the later stage of Brace Girdle's career. So Carol McKean had asked um, when she was no longer acting, did she remain active in the business side of the theatre? And Robert Lovelin had asked again about her later career. How late did she perform? Did the reception towards her change as she got older? And then I guess that leads into, and did she stay in the business side after she wasn't acting? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, Brace Girdle had, we think about a 20 year career. We think that she left the stage around 1707, though she did return for one command performance in 1709, which was Thomas Betterton's farewell from the stage. And this is this, um, this performance where he was performing the role of Valentine in Congreve's great play, Love for Love. And he was, he was so weak that Elizabeth Berry and Anne Grace Girdle have to physically support him when he plays the role of the young lover, Valentine. Um, Grace Girdle continued to, uh, to play in both tragedy and comedy. And it should be noted that, um, that there were many uh, revivals of, uh, of plays in the restoration in early 18th century. So that, um, I mean, the, the memories of these actors and actresses, um, they had to be able to, you know, they, they could act five different plays in one week and they had to be able to call up plays that they might not have acted for a couple of years to perform them. So Brace Girdle acted for about 20 years. She, she played um, tragedies and comedies, as I mentioned, and then um, there's, there's a really unfortunate anecdote about Brace Girdle supposedly being chased from the stage by the next up and coming actress named Anne Oldfield. I've written an article about how I, I think we've given way too much attention to these unverified theatrical anecdotes. I think Brace Girdle retired because she wanted to retire after 20 years. Um, and she does not seem to have been particularly connected with the theater after that. She did live for another 30 years and she can, you know, people remember her. She was supposed to be very charitable and uh, did some charity work uh, in her retirement. And uh, when she died, she did leave a, de a decent um, estate, uh, but, uh, but we don't know a whole lot about her life after she leaves the theater. Hmm. Great. Well, we have, um, that, that was a great, uh, thank you for uh, blending those questions together so beautifully, Kirsten. Um, it's, it's getting late and we're starting to run uh, to the end of our session. Um, but if uh, if we could, I, I just did have one question that I wanted to ask um, about the merits of madness between the sexes. You talked about men being connoted as wise or talented, whereas women were portrayed in a less sympathetic light. Um, and that performers of the mad songs were the most respected manifestations of this disease for women. And you used Shakespeare's Ophelia as one example. Um, in Hamlet, as many people probably know, she enters singing fragments of songs about chaos, death, and unrequited love. So in a sense, she has her own mad song. Um, and Brahms and Strauss, just to add, uh, you know, over the eras, Ophelia's texts have been set. It's so it, so it's a very highly sympathetic, um, she's a highly sympathetic character. Can you say something in a, just a minute or two about that? Absolutely. So Ophelia is probably, um, you know, her, her fragments are considered the most uh, famous mad songs um, of all time. Uh, many people have written about them um, and Ophelia herself you know, has, has become such an, um, uh, an important character in the study of Hamlet. I was realizing the other day that of, of the 20 scenes in the play Hamlet, Ophelia, Ophelia only um, appears in one quarter of them, but she's taken, especially these days, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, She's taken up so much uh, literary criticism and theater criticism and her mad songs are so interesting. Um, 
I know that um, <laughs> one thing she deals with through these mad songs is the question of whether she's actually consummated her relationship with Hamlet. And so in one of these um, mad song fragments, tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, she sort of suggests that, um, uh, well, she has a line, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. And so this, you know, this question of did did Hamlet tumble Ophelia? Did they have premarital sex? Was there a promise that was not kept? And so the question of, you know, what actually, how far did Hamlet and Ophelia's um, relationship go is hinted at um, in Ophelia's mad song. Of course, th this, um, I mean, to go back to Kirsten's question, um, this brings up Another issue that Ophelia, if she was not singing, she couldn't talk about this on stage, right? She couldn't accuse Hamlet, you know, she couldn't say, well, we, you know, we had sex and now you're, uh, you're, you're going away from me and, and our marriage isn't going to work out. But here is a case where it can be um, brought up through uh, through singing. And so uh, it goes along uh, with Kirsten, your, uh, your point about some things can be said through this form that otherwise uh, couldn't really be raised on the stage. We did have one more question from one of our attendees, Jane Harwell, if we have, if we can spend like two minutes to answer. She, she was saying, um, obviously, Dana, you've talked to us about how the mad songs help Brace Girdle recuperate her image. But Jane was wondering whether it might also have been a way for her to work out trauma after this whole experience of her possible lover, but certainly acting partner being murdered and her own attempted abduction and rape. Absolutely. I mean, I can only imagine what Brace Girdle was going through on, you know, December 10th, 1692, having just heard that her uh, her, her, you know, her onstage leading man has been killed by the same person who tried to abduct her. I mean, what trauma, what incredible trauma. It's been a little hard for us to pin down exactly how, um, how long she took um, between that date uh, to then return to the stage. I can only speculate about what she was feeling, but I imagine the trauma would have been incredibly deep. And, uh, you know, she returns and um, one of the very first plays that she performs in is the Richmond heiress where she, she sings that mad song duet with, um, uh, with, with Thomas Doggett where she affirms her, uh, her virgin status. So absolutely, I do think, I mean, I, I, um, it's really hard not to speculate. You know, of course we have no idea what she was thinking. We, there's no diaries, there's no letters that we can draw on to get any sense of her interiority, but certainly um, the mad songs do seem to fit with, um, with the experiences in her life that she had just gone through. Well, Sadly, we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, and I just want to, th I'm, I'm beyond thrilled that, uh, Diana, that you um, consented to come and speak to our audience. Um, this has been video recorded and, and will be shared um, with some editing. Um, and I want to thank uh, those of you who stayed to the very end. <laughs> um, thank you for stopping to take a listen. Um, you can find more information about our upcoming performance of A Restoration Macbeth, which um, in which Natalia will play a role and which Kirsten will be directing um, at our website, which is in the chat, www.bostonpersal.org. Um, you can also view links to our past um, productions of some restoration theater pieces on our YouTube channel. Finally, I cannot leave without saying that we are a nonprofit organization, uh, 501c3, and um, all of our programming and um, is, we're able to do it with the support of our audience and donors. So um, if you uh, want to become a supporter, you can also visit our website. Um, all your donations directly support our programs and amazing singers like Amanda and Sarah. Um, 
So thank you all for coming. Um, stay safe and take care. And mad let us be. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you again, ladies. It's been great. So I'm going to stop the recording now. So uh,